Hey everyone, today I am talking with Angela Hanscom. Angela is the author of Barefoot and Balanced, How Unrestricted Outdoor Play Makes for Strong, Confident, and Capable Children. Angela is also the founder of Timbernook. Timbernook is a movement program that gets children outside and in nature, barefoot if possible. Angela is a champion for getting children moving outdoors in nature as we were designed to move. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So Angela, you've written balanced and barefoot and you created a program called timber nook and to me you are a champion for getting children to move the way they were designed to move thanks um so i guess my first question is are today's children or our children are they moving enough yeah no i i would say definitely not um for a number of reasons i feel like pre-pandemic it was already a huge issue uh because kids are I think the average um, amount of time kids are sitting is about nine hours a day in America. The most recent research that I was sitting in on was there in a seat for about nine hours a day. And so that's a, that's a lot of sitting. Um, and then, um, you know, kids are often really scheduled as well after school and then they have homework. And so a good portion of their, of their day, they're sitting. And then with the pandemic, I felt like at first it was a good thing. I saw a lot of people hiking with their families and moving more. But, um, and then the other problem though, was that a lot of people went virtual. And so um, there's a lot more screen time. So it'd be interesting to look at, you know, like how it compares, but it's still, if not more of an issue, it's definitely still very much an issue that they're not moving enough. What are, what are the consequences of, of a children not getting enough movement into, into their days? Um, there's a lot. Um, the, one of the biggest issues is that when you're in a constantly in this upright position, um, inside your inner air, ears are little hair cells and we need to move in rapid ways. Um, so like spinning in circles, going upside down. So that fluid moves back and forth and stimulates those hair cells. And that develops your vestibular sense. And that sense is kind of key to all the other senses. Um, we, as an occupational therapist, we, we talk a lot about sensory integration. And that's basically organization of um, the brain. And so, and, and it lays a foundation for learning. Um, but if that system is underdeveloped, let's say kids are sitting too much and then the fluid thickens and they start, you know, having issues um, with like ear infections or, you know, they're just simply not moving enough. Um, it can affect, it can affect everything. It can affect attention in the classroom. Um, we're finding kids are literally falling out of their chairs now. And which is um, not something I believe till I saw it. <laughs> and um, I was observing a classroom and a kid literally fell out of their chair and onto the ground. And I remember the teacher saying, that's the third time today, get back in your seat. Um, but this is becoming more and more of an issue is that kids are starting to run into each other more often, um, fall out of the chair on a more frequent basis. So this lack of body awareness, um, they're becoming almost uh, more unsafe in their environment because they're not getting the movement they need. Um, and then, you know, there's the eye, the eyes also, um, that vestibular sense supports all six eye muscles to work as a team. And so it acts like a tripod to stabilize the eyes, um, to be able to track for reading and writing. And so, um, so that can be an issue. There can be visual issues. Um, and then there's also like what we call it arousal level where kids are almost off the wall. You know, we, we say that they're hyper, they're more active if they're not getting enough movement. Um, that's directly related to getting enough movement as well. So, um, there's a, and you may have heard of her, uh, there's a child psychologist named Sally Goddard Blythe. Uh, she wrote a book called The Well-Balanced Child. Oh, okay. Um, but in that, she, she's talking about the vestibular system, and she's, she's, she says that mastering head control is essential for balanced posture and coordination. Yeah. And so it sounds like you're saying that our children are losing their balance, their posture, and their coordination. <laughs> they can't even yeah, stay in chairs. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so, and I've, I've long been a thinker that I don't even know if that makes sense but I've always thought that there's not enough movement in schools mm -hmm. um like there's either PEs cut short or there's no PE but that 
that seems like that's a problem if movement actually helps facilitate learning. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. what happens if, if, if there's no PE in schools though, and, and the kids go virtual, like, is there any, is there any PE at home? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> are the, cause the parents don't know they're probably trying to work or trying to, uh, who knows how, how it's very hard to juggle a child being virtual as a parent. If you have a job yeah, and your kid's supposed to be in school. Oh, it's like, very hard. What happens? Well, I think it will depend on the family, like, you know, and it depends on, I mean, so many different factors, but like if the adults are also on the computer, yeah, it makes it really hard to make sure that that kid's getting time outside. Um, but if like one of the parents doesn't work or something and can take the children outside, I think all of those make a difference. So for, this is a silly question, but for balanced and barefoot, yeah, why barefoot? Um, because it's, it's really, we weren't really designed to wear shoes. And, um, I actually worked with a barefoot company for a little bit. And I remember them showing me images of what it looks like when you wear shoes compared to what, um, your feet really should look like. And, um, it's kind of interesting because the feet really should be able to spread out and, um, like we shouldn't have such high arches and they did research and compared, you know, the muscle strength in the, in the foot and the ankles when you wear regular shoes all the time compared to barefoot shoes. <clears throat> and the muscles in those that wear barefoot shoes are stronger, obviously, and so were the ankles. But if you think about it, if you're putting pressure up on different parts of the foot, um, all different parts of the foot, you're strengthening um, the foot and the ankles as you walk and navigate your environment. And so, of course, you're going to have stronger foot muscles and the ankles as well. Um, you also get proprioceptive, proprioceptive input. So you get, um, you know, a better sense of where your body is in space. You can feel, literally feel the ground. Um, so that will also help give feedback to the child of where their body is um, and help with balance. Awesome. So you got barefoot and you got balance and you created timber nook. Yeah. <laughs> what is, what is timber nook? Oh, so timber nook. Um, so as an occupational therapist, um, we work on um, the occupations of, of children. So adults is a little different, obviously, but for children, their occupation is basically school and play. And so um, we're very good as occupational therapists to like our clinics are usually indoors. We're not typically outside. So if you go into a therapy clinic, you'll see that we bring our swings inside. We have ball pits, kind of like Chuck E. Cheese. Um, <laughs> we bring in board games. We might bring in a little bin of sand and have kids like, and call that sensory. Um, but the more I was outdoors with my own children, and then um, I started a program here um, about 13 years ago, in my backyard, because I noticed there wasn't a lot of children playing outside. Um, the more I observed children in the woods, I realized that this, this really was the ultimate sensory experience. You know, you couldn't replicate giant mud puddles in a clinic setting with multiple children, you know, it's usually one on one with a child. Um, you know, so what sensory, they're both considered sensory, right? A little a bin of sand versus giant mud puddles, but one was fully immersive. And it was it was real, a real environment with other children. There was real frogs in there. And um, you just couldn't replicate the therapeutic benefits of, of that kind of environment compared to trying to replicate something like that indoors. And so, um, so I really realized that outdoor play is a very important occupation for children. We kept focusing on indoor play, again, bringing everything indoors. And um, the occupation of outdoor play is like such an important one. All of us have, you know, such fond memories of that growing up. And it was really, it's really at risk in ways that we never imagined. And so my mission has become to really, um, to kind of restore that, to restore the occupation of outdoor play, but um, not only that, to enrich it, to make sure it's as authentic as possible. You know, it's true neighborhood play. There's a, you know, adults fade, fade away because, um, you know, it's really not about us. It's about kind of recreating that environment we had growing up where the adults weren't like constantly directing the play. <laughs> um, and, you know, so the kids have different, basically giant play experiences out there. So 
They'll do everything from um, creating entire societies out in the woods where, um, you know, they'll create the flies. Yeah, it's, yeah, except for it doesn't, and that's why we're there. <laughs> so, we, so it doesn't become Lord of the Flies, but, you know, um, but our providers are trained to know when to go in and when not to go in. Um, and that it's okay if they're arguing, you know, like they, um, what we learned over the years is that, let's say you were building a fort out there. If, it, if an adult was standing too close to that, um, those children, what happened is the children would start turning to the adult for constant reassurance and say, is this okay? Um, what do I do next? Um, and tattling too. So they're more likely to tattle on each other if adult is so their presence is really um, right there. Um, versus if we backed up, let's say 10, 20 feet and we got down low. So we reduce adult presence in the woods, but we could still supervise them. We're there for safety, but we're not, we're not so up and you know, front and present, um, they would start turning to each other, the kids, to solve their own problems, to initiate their own play ideas and execute those play ideas without the need of constant adult reassurance. So they were learning conflict resolution and, and cooperation and like just life skills. Yeah, yeah and just how to play even, because they're starting to, they're, I've, I've seen kids lose ability um, or never learn how to play, which is wow. crazy. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of adults that don't know how to play too. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> so, um, have you had have you noticed or witnessed any with taking kids outside, like any huge changes in children, like any stories about stuff like that? Yeah, so a lot of stories. Um, we had one child who didn't like to go barefoot, um, and he. Um, had plastic welly boots on when he came he knew we were going to the giant mud puddles and he's like I know we're going to the mud and he's like I'm not taking these boots off and I'm like all right that's fine so we walked down and um, other children were catching frogs and so he got right to the edge and he got so excited about it that he went right in and the water went in his plastic welly boots and he had socks on so that feels gross right so he comes back out and he's like this is disgusting um you know, there's mud in my boots. Can I take these off? I said, sure. So he took them off and then he went in barefoot to catch the frogs because that play was so motivating for the frogs was really motivating. Um, so it trumped his fear. Um, I ended up telling the mom later about him going barefoot. And she goes, do you know, we had been trying to get him to go barefoot in a clinic setting. He had been in therapy for two years, unsuccessful. And um, here he is going barefoot in the mud. He started, it was a real environment. So he started going barefoot camping. Um, so he was able to generalize that skill over to other settings because it was, again, a real environment and it was his choice. So if I had said, no, I think you should have tried to take your shoes off. You know, what do you think he would have done? Probably fight back against you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, anytime kids have sensor issues too, there's often anxiety tied to that. So it's really important that everything's a choice. Um, we never even suggest kids go barefoot here. It's all just, it's all a choice as part, you know, of the environment. So. So if, if kids don't get enough movement and, and if they're lucky enough, maybe, maybe they get an hour of recess at school, maybe. And that's, I think that would be lucky. That would be, <laughs> that would be really lucky. <laughs> so let's just imagine, let's imagine that sure. at, at school, a kid got an hour a day which I think's the pipe dream. Would that be enough movement to, to keep them like regulated and learning and, you know, just healthy? I don't, I still don't think that's enough. I think, um, I think at least three hours of active play and movement a day is ideal or more. Wow. And, and I, the reason why I say that is when I speak um, to different groups, I always ask like, how much play time did you get growing up outdoors? you know, like give me, you know, th think about your recess, think about time outdoors after, and then give me a total amount. And this is elementary school. And I always get between four and six hours that adults were playing outside, you know, like digging in the dirt for hours, going upside down, like engaging the muscles and senses and developing them properly. It was like, yeah, four to six hours. And then I, I say, tell me about child that, you know, and they give me a total amount of time that they're outside. And um, I get, usually 45 minutes to an hour and a half, but I think that's kind of idealistic 
because the research is like really bad right now. It's like four to seven minutes oh. a day that they're getting outside. So it's like really small. That must be like a walk to the mailbox or something. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's almost non-existent. Yeah. So for the wonder that tender timber nook creates in the woods or out in nature what about children that live in the city though what can they do well i think we have to kind of remember what we did in the past too um because the difference is that everyone's really busy and no one's watching out for each other anymore we didn't we don't create a village as much you know i don't like even our neighbors here like you know, I would love to be closer to my neighbors. Like, I just think people are so focused on what they're doing. Um, so like the successful, the people that I've talked to that have been successful in sub, sub, like the suburbs and in urban areas is they come together. So like in cities, they can, there's been different things where they shut down the streets and they allow kids to play. And there's, there's some adult watching. Um, so, but taking turns, like it doesn't have to all fall on one person. I think if you take turns at like who's watching the children um, and then in suburbs, they've done something similar where neighborhoods will just agree. They'll come together and say, we're going to allow our kids to bike to each other's homes. And, you know, we're all, there's always going to be someone kind of keeping an eye out for them. So I think it kind of goes back to making a little bit of an effort um, and set an example for the, the community. So speaking of setting an example, um, the first I was we were supposed to have this interview uh, a few weeks ago yeah. um, and I had some appliances show up way early, but I was so I, I was researching Timber Nook and I was I was totally digging like it just resonated with me. So I thought, well, this is great for kids. Yeah. And so I thought, well, you know what? I got some woods out back. So I went out uh, for about 45 minutes into the woods and I started like climbing on logs and going over creeks and stuff like that. And I, and it was fun, but, and I had all this energy when I got back and then I was going to talk to you, but I didn't get to. So I, today, as it so happens, another cool day, I was like, you know, I'm going to do that again. Oh, that's awesome. So I went outside and cause I, I wanted to be prepared. Right. So I'm climbing logs, jumping over uh, creeks and, or just, and then just throwing rocks or, you know, in the water. And, but it just felt, it felt good. And it was very, it was peaceful, but it also, I don't know. It was just, it was just nice. It's like something, maybe I needed it and didn't even know I needed it. Yeah. So what about adults? Like, don't adults need outside play or like, can you speak to that? Because if children aren't moving, I know adults are moving. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, obviously my passion is children, but yeah, we, we do need to keep moving. Um, one reason why a lot of us can't tolerate rides when we're older is because we're not moving enough. So our, <laughs> we start to feel like nauseous. Um, and that's again, because we're in this upright position a lot. And so that vestibular sense can weaken. And so um, when we go on rides that move us in all different directions, we feel really sick. So a lot of times occupational therapists will advocate for adults to keep moving. So like, especially in the older populations, like, you know, doing aerobics in the water or, you know, doing some sort of dance class, it basically gets you out of that, um, you know, like this um, upright position all the time. And it will help prevent falls and hip fractures and, um, it keeps you really strong. So yeah, we definitely want adults to move and you can create change to the vestibular sense. It's, it's something, it's kind of like the muscular sense. So if you work out a couple times a week, you can get strong and, and develop muscles, but you have to maintain it. It's the same with the vestibular. If you are not getting enough movement that can, um, it can weaken over time. So, so what I'm hearing you say though, is that adults as they age don't lose their vestibular system their balance their posture and coordination because they're aging they're losing it because they're not engaging in it yeah i mean there might be some other issues going on that can affect their um like the 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 vestibular complex in there but um for the majority of healthy adults yeah you i mean environment definitely plays a factor if you're not getting enough movement opportunities so but the thing, the thing that we really want to pay attention to is that with adults, you often have a choice if you want to move or not. So it's, it's more that we're choosing not to move. Um, whereas with kids, it's not always the case. Often they want to move 
but we're saying, no, you can't right now because you're supposed to be learning. And the fact that kids are falling um, from an early age um, out of their chairs tells you something's not right. And we need to make sure that we prioritize movement for them because we're, and we're also creating a foundation. I mean, the brain is really malleable when they're little. So it's really, really important that they move from a really early age. Where can, if say a parent's listening to this and they want to get more information um, about Timbernook, yeah. where can they go? Um, so they can go to our website, um, timbernook.com, and they can find a Timbernook location. We're in four countries, so they can look to see, you know, there's Timbernook year-round programming, there's summer camps, there's night experiences, um, so they can look for something. Um, and then Timbernook on uh, Facebook is pretty active. So we do a lot on the current research, um, articles to read um, and different connections of, you know, how playing outdoors can actually affect um, neuroscience. Awesome. Yeah. And if you had one message to give adults or parents uh, that have children, what would it be? So I would just remember how impo- important outdoor play is when you, especially when you like try to remember what it was like when you were growing up and um, really try to prioritize that going forward, especially now more than ever, because play and connection is, is healing for children. And so more than ever, and it's safer outside. So even during a pandemic, it's really important to invite kids over for the day and allow your kids that time to play outside whenever possible. Angela, thank you so much. This has been this has been fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.